Okay, um, first of all, I have to just apologize about my accent. It's not a speech impediment. Born and raised in South Africa, immigrated about 26 years ago. And since then, I've been working throughout a number of different industries. I've spent a number of years at CAN4, Englewood Logging Operation. And um, I'm going to share with you some of my experiences that I've picked up over the years, working in a number of different countries. Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, all through Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm into the UK as well as parts of Europe. Analyzing education and training systems, finding out what they do and how we can make it more effective. So what I've done is taken all those international best practices, distilled them down into their fundamental principles, and for the last two years been working with the council and industry bringing that model into industry and working with subject matter experts to put tools in place to equip supervisors with the knowledge and skill on how to develop a qualified workforce. And now for something completely different. It's not going to be the usual PowerPoint presentation. I like Ken's style where he has a, power, uh, a flip chart. But my diagrams, I've already got onto a whiteboard, drawn them up, and taken photographs of them and put them up on here. So instead of using a traditional PowerPoint, we're going to go through and do something totally different. First of all, why do you have to focus on training? You heard this morning about demographics, how to recruit and attract people into the industry. You've also heard the difference between the generations at work. We faced with a mature workforce. There's quite a high turnover in the solid wood sector, about 1,000 people needed every single year coming into that sector to maintain the exodus. So there's about a 40% turnover, mainly trades. And the trade system in BC is quite sophisticated. It's replicated itself right across the country. Red Seal occupations out there as well, and national standards on how to become a journey person heavy-duty mechanic, electrician, diesel engine mechanic. So there's a lot of training and education out there for some of those folks. On the forestry and logging sector, we're anticipating about a 60% turnover, also needing about 1,000 workers per year, every year, for the next 10 years. Absent a training system in place to develop ground crew, equipment operators, and fallers, um, we're going to find ourselves in a very, very difficult position. There is a faller training program. I'll speak briefly about that, how it's undergoing a significant rebirth into a whole new model that focuses on practical skills versus what exists today. We're going to see an influx of new workers. And with that influx of new workers, you're going to see a risk of injury if you haven't already seen some of the upturn on the steps. And this is through a lack of knowledge or a lack of skill. So you also heard this morning about regulation. So this is a quick recap. Qualified workers, the definition of a qualified worker is a person who has the knowledge of the job, the hazards involved, and the means to control them through education, training, or experience, or a combination. Supervision. You also heard about that this morning. This is a person who provides the instruction, direction, and control. You also heard about supervisory systems. But the actual function of the supervisor working with qualified workers, providing that instruction and direction to make sure that they're qualified, that they're knowledgeable of the job, the hazards involved, and the means to control it. Lastly, we get into due diligence. That was also spoken about this morning. The standard of due diligence taking all reasonable steps and if anything should go wrong, you find yourself in a position of defense where you have to show that reasonable steps to comply were taken in all the circumstances. So, supervisors in the room, raise your hands. How many of you? I'm sure there's a lot more of you. What I want you guys to do, and if there's any woman out there, supervisors working with some of the crews as we start getting into some of the forestry engineering occupations, go back to the workplace and do a training needs analysis. And it's a simple tool I'm going to put in front of you. I've developed this over the years, and it's come in very, very handy for me. Think of education. And again, you heard the humorous definition between education and training. 
Um, education is the process of acquiring that knowledge. Training is the process of improving one's capability and capacity to do the job. Experience is an also very important component. This is the time it takes to master the occupation. And that's under a range of conditions. So if you're training a log truck driver, you don't teach them over the summer and qualify them over the summer because now they start driving under winter conditions, very different parameters. So training across a range of conditions to develop those skills and competencies over time. The other piece I want to introduce is confidence. So this is the person's state of mind, their state of being. The actions they choose are the right ones for the job. Now this is the tricky part as well where a person on a scale of zero to 100 where they're fully competent, beyond that they start getting into a danger zone as well where they become overconfident and they start taking risks. So confidence is something to keep in mind and integrity. This is a person's ability to follow policies and procedures and stay within the rule sets that have been established in the workplace. So you take those five points, connect them, create a scale converging in the center with a starting point right in the middle of zero. So this is where you take that scale and you look at every single employee that you have and then you look at the organization using these criteria and you score them and you rank them where they fit. Wherever they fit within the green area, that shows what the person's skill is. Once you go beyond that, that's where you have exposure. The longer a person stays in that zone, the higher the probability of having an injury or causing an accident, injuring other workers. And the purpose of education and training is to get everyone to that same point. So. Over the last number of years at the Council, what we've sat down is with industry folks to start looking at how do we define competencies. We know that a qualified worker is the combination of education, training, and experience. So what we did is we started, if you guys, I'll, I'll come across to your side and I'll show you on that, that part as well. We looked at these occupations, and I'll take occupation A, occupation B, and occupation C. And we started sitting down with subject matter experts looking at all the competencies that make up that occupation, and we began to define them. And I'll use a, a falling example where we're looking at the oil and gas sector, wildfire, and production harvesting. So we spoke to Enform, spoke to some of the fallers um, in the oil and gas sector, looked at occupation A. We began to define the breadth and depth of that occupation. We met with the folks from wildfire. So we can say that was occupation B. We began to define with the subject matter experts what makes up that occupation. We noticed there were some overlaps between oil and gas and wildfire. And then we did the same activity with production harvesting. Sat down over a number of months with the subject matter experts meeting all over the province to define what makes up a production faller and we began to define the competencies. Now, recognizing that there's going to be this influx of new workers, as we went through and started defining all these, these Lego building blocks of that occupation, we realized there was a whole band of common competencies right across the bottom. So the band that sits right across the bottom is a great example of how we can take that material and start working with the secondary education system and the post-secondary education system, and getting training about the forest industry and safety into the schools, into the post-secondary institutions, so that when they cross the threshold and come to you as the employer, the supervisors now know that that person has some pre-existing knowledge of the forest industry. And now you start getting into the on-the-job training portion. Or you look at that occupation where they come in with all the common competencies right across the bottom and they're moving into occupation A, you just have to focus on training the pieces that they don't have. So this is a model of gap training where you give recognition for prior learning or current competence and then you close the gaps and you train the, the employee up to the standard that's required. And the standard for the occupation are all those squares within occupation A or occupation B or occupation C. It also allows a person from the oil and gas sector to move into wildfire or move into production harvesting. And they come in with some pre-existing knowledge and skill. 
and you train them to close the gap. We know that there is a model out there right now where WorkSafe recognizes a faller certificate of qualification, where the faller is qualified from oil and gas or from production harvesting. But the actual work they do in the oil and gas sector is vastly different to what you do on the coast or in the interior. And there's some deficiencies in skills and knowledge that this new model is able to train the person how to close that gap and become more qualified. So as we looked at all these occupations, right in the top left-hand side, that's a competency. Every, every square on that table is a competency. And a competency, we basically began to define that in a document called a competency standard. We've looked at the elements of competence and the outcomes. Most education systems will give a person all the knowledge that they need. They go to a college, they sit in a classroom. We structured things very differently with the subject matter experts from industry. We figured, what does the person do at the end of the day? So they have to demonstrate that they've got knowledge of something or demonstrate they've got the ability to do something. So we sat down with the subject matter experts and we began to define all of those competency outcomes. And all the competency outcomes have standards embedded with them. So if it's operate chainsaw, to equipment manufacturer's standard or specification. Every piece of equipment out there, like equipment operators, you move from a John Deere piece of equipment to a finning a piece of equipment, Caterpillar piece of equipment. Um, they've all got their own operating standards, operating manuals, but some of the general principles remain the same. So the outcomes define to the standard, and instead of saying you're going to be operating a specific kind of backhoe or excavator, we've defined those standards so that it's going to embed all of the manufacturer's equipment and it's not going to be focused on a specific piece of equipment. So once we know that those outcomes define the knowledge of or the ability to do something, a person needs underpinning knowledge in order to go and go into the workplace and start demonstrating. So we also defined with the subject matter experts all of the underpinning knowledge that that person needs. Using other subject matter experts as well as technical writers, we sat down and started figuring out, well, how do we put this into a learning resource that people can use? So we've developed all of the documentation for the courses uh, that's been um, made available soon online and in paper-based. We're going to teach instructors on how to train those programs. And that's going to be available, as I said, online, paper-based, and blended learning where there's a combination of theory and practical instruction. To measure the success of that individual in the job, we've also developed a toolkit for supervisors on how to evaluate that person. So in the past, there was no training materials. A person would learn by trial and error. One operator would train another operator. Bad habits would be passed on. And in an event when there's an accident, WorkSafe will do an inspection, and they'll often find a number of reasons. That one, the person wasn't qualified. Then you say, well, they were trained by Harry. And they'll say, well, was Harry qualified as an operator, and was Harry qualified to train? So what we've done is we've put all these standards together to help the trainers in the workplace deliver the material. And we've also put materials together for the supervisor to do evaluation of that individual against the outcomes. And that training is uh, pretty straightforward. The tools are straightforward. There's checklists. Uh, you can have competency conversations with the individual. You have them demonstrate something, and you evaluate them against the criteria. So I spoke about qualified trainer. Now, this is a person who's going to go out there and work with the employee and follow a structured approach to training against all those outcomes that have been defined on the competency standards. Those are made available to the trainees as well as all the learning resources made available to the trainees. And um, they can take training any time that they want. Um, that is the education component of it. The on-the-job training portion is the time that it takes, once the person has the underpinning knowledge, on-the-job training, they get onto a piece of equipment, they're working with a coach, mentor, that's showing them some of the techniques, they're using the learning resources, we've distilled all of the 
um, operator manuals into some pretty basic instructions on what they should be doing at the start of uh, a shift, start of operating the equipment, when they operate, when they shut equipment down. All of those things would be defined. As the person's going through the on-the-job training, they are being assessed as well against the same set of standards. And at the end of the day, when the supervisor is satisfied that that worker is performing consistently and competently against the, the guideline or the standard, they would then be recognized by industry as being qualified. So what have we been doing? With the SMEs, we've uh, looked at all the yarding occupations. We've defined competency standards, we've developed learning resources and assessment tools for the supervisors to evaluate workers in those occupations when they're performing against that guideline that's been established. Those are available. Uh, we're gonna start doing a, a, a launch of that, a soft launch. We're working with Island Timberlands. And on the 15th of June, we're gonna start doing some uh, training and assessment of existing workers. So these are folks that have been on the job for a number of years. Island Timberlands is trying to define, do they have a gap in their knowledge and skill? Um, are they working efficiently? Are they qualified? At the same time, we're working with Western Forest Products that are interested in implementing this model to determine if their workers are qualified. And they're going to follow a different approach. They're going to go out and recruit brand new trainees coming into industry for the first time. And they'll put them from starting point all the way through the training until they become qualified and competent on the job. So two companies, two different target audiences, one existing workers, one brand new trainees coming into the system. And uh, uh, Western, I think, is going to be starting this in the spring of uh, 2018. In addition to yarding, we've been working on the foiler occupation. Uh, there's been a number of workshops with uh, foilers around the province. We've been uh, working with some of the colleges looking at uh, the training that's existing today. Uh, worked extensively with Peter Sprout and now with Glenn Hessness from the council. And um, Daisy's been actively involved. If you were at the session yesterday, you would have seen Daisy. We've defined all the competency standards with those SMEs for the smaller occupations. And we've also worked with NFORM um, Wildfire Services and the council to define those competencies all across the bottom of the, the chart for the oil and gas, wildfire, and production harvesting. Here's an example of the competencies. Each one of those numbers represents a unit of competence. And what we've done with those units of competence is right at the bottom left-hand side, wherever it says F, that's forestry, WF is wildfire, oil, and gas. You can see a person in the forestry sector starts at unit 1002. And once they've got that completed, they can go start 1003, 1004, 1008. And they can also go up and do uh, 41. And they would move through this process. And if the person doesn't have the attributes to be a faller, they could exit now with a chainsaw certificate, or they could continue a few more units and come out with a certificate as a bucker. Or if they have the right skills, they can continue. They work their way through the whole program and come out at the very top with the certificate of qualification as a faller. This is the first time we've got the oil and gas sector, wildfire, and production harvesting working together, looking at those competency standards, doing that alignment, recognizing where there are differences between the different jobs, and then specifying that when the person gets that certificate, then that will truly be a certificate uh, to fall. But it will also say on it that they're a faller in the oil and gas sector, or it'll say wildfire. But if they've completed all of those competencies, um, a person may have gone across and done uh, 1033, 1034, 1047, as well as 1045, every single competency on that area, that would then give them a certificate to work in all three sectors and industry would recognize that they're qualified to do that. So it's, it's a very harmonized approach at doing it. And it's also an efficient way of setting one package of learning resources together to take the person through all the training to address chainsaw certificate needs for people outside of our sector, 
that may work in parks and recreation. A person may be a log truck driver that wants to buck the end of a log. It's sticking out too far. At least they've got some training and you know that they are qualified to use that piece of equipment. We've also put all of this into a learning management system. And the learning management system is uh, called Totera. It's an open source platform. All of the learning resources will be available free of charge uh, to an individual to pick up that knowledge and skill to further uh, their, their education and also gives you the tools to ensure that that worker has the underpinning knowledge. And then in the workplace, you would be using those same sets of tools. Again, no charge for those tools. It's to equip you with that uh, toolkit to make sure that your workers are qualified. It's going to be available in a modular online format. You can also take paper-based format. So once you log on, you can print out the PDFs and your, your learners can go through and learn in the traditional style in a classroom with paper material or online embedded tests available 24 by 7 by 365. And it works on all sorts of electronic devices, uh, um, Android, Apple, it works on PC, Mac, as well as uh, Linux and Unix system. I've been doing some tests on that. It's great for competency tracking and reporting. So if anything should go wrong, you can always print out the transcript of that person's training and education. And that can become part of the evidence that you could sit down with WorkSafe to say, this worker was qualified because they were trained by this person, they were assessed by that person, they were qualified and we determined that this person was qualified on this date after they'd demonstrated repeatedly over time that they were able to perform that task according to the standard. We're also working on road building um, for those occupations. This is work underway right now where we're developing those competencies. In addition to that, we're also working on mechanized harvesting. And some of you may have attended uh, Jamal's uh, talk this morning on steep slope. So we're putting all the competency standards in place to train operators, what I'll call normal operating parameters. And then once they go into traction assist operating environments, there's additional hazards and risks. And we'll equip those operators with the, the knowledge and skill on how to recognize those and work around those areas. So we're working with Jamal and we'll be including that in the material as well. Lastly, we're also working on transportation. Log truck drivers is a very important uh, occupation. Um, there's been a number of incidents. There is some work that's been underway. We've just recently completed a, a pilot program um, that was run through our Prince George office. Uh, Trish was actively involved in that as well. And we had 100% completion rate and 100% employment coming out of that competency-based program. So it's very early stages of that. All sorts of other occupations that we're developing as well. Um, one of the uh, recent ones, a bit of scope creep, we were asked also to include heli rigging, uh, so the rigging slinger. Um, also for silver culture, we're now developing competency standards for brush saw operators, and this is going to go on and on. If you have any questions, I really encourage you to get in touch with Gerard Messier, and that's his email. Gerard's been actively involved in coordinating lots of these activities. And I'm looking for, at any time that you want to start using a model like this or to learn more about the model, 30 minutes doesn't do justice to it. There's all sorts of material that I can put in front of you to show you practical examples of how this works. Um, but lastly, I heard this morning that one of the issues that uh, supervisors face is way too much paperwork. We're looking at an electronic system on how we could use an Android device or any Apple device to track all of those on-the-job training competencies and the assessments so that once that's been done and you're back in Wi-Fi range, it automatically syncs back into the system, meaning there's going to be less paperwork for you, but at least you still do need to like, capture some of the, inform the, the information and the data on that individual so that you can pull up a transcript of their learning and education. Thanks very much. <laughs>